now, sweet inspiration. In the second programme of this new series on BBC One, Alan Titchmarsh discovers the hymns that have had particular significance for Stephanie Cole. Stephanie Cole is one of those actresses whose face everybody knows. She can be tipsy in a bit of a do, or silently stoic in Tenko, or indomitable in Waiting for God. Which hymns have provided the real Stephanie with sweet inspiration? And why did she choose to leave London to live in a cottage in Warwickshire? Well, I decided that I wanted some solitude and some peace, which I don't get much in London. And at first I was going to go back to the West Country, where, which is where I was brought up. But there were sort of too many echoes. And in fact, my mother was born in Warwickshire, I was born in Warwickshire, my father lived in Warwickshire, and my half-sister lives in Warwickshire. And we also film Waiting for God just down the road near Whitney. And uh, I thought, it's a beautiful county. I think I might have a look around there. So I did, and that's why. Do you find it then easier to have a faith in surroundings like this than in, in, in the hustle and bustle of a city. Of course it's easier, because you can go into that, that quiet. You can hear the still, small voice much more easily when you're in peace and quiet, can't you? I mean, this morning I woke up and I don't have any curtains at my bedroom window because it's so... I love being woken by the sun, I love seeing moonlight and so on and so forth. And I woke up this morning, it was a glorious day, and I looked out at the hills of Gloucestershire, Warwickshire and Oxfordshire, because I can see all three counties. And, I mean, it was just... it takes your breath away, and it's so easy to believe. It is so easy, you know, and it's, so that's quite nice to come back to that and then, and then go out and test it. When you think of your childhood, which hymns stick in your mind? I mean, which have got the childhood um, images? Well, I tell you, because, I, because it was by the sea, right, and so the sea was very much part of my life. I learned to swim almost before I could walk and so on and so forth. And uh, I was at this tiny little school in a place called Braunton, and uh, we used to go to church, of course, every Sunday. And uh, the thing that always got me was for those in peril on the sea. And I used to, I used to stand there crying I'm not quite sure because I didn't know any sailors. I certainly didn't know any drowned sailors. But I thought this was tremendously kind of powerful stuff. And that was my very first favourite hymn. <laughs>
did that childhood faith continue or did, did you waver? Oh, I mean, I didn't just waver. In my sort of late teens, I completely lost all faith. Uh, I mean, I can remember when I was about sort of 17 or 18, someone saying, oh, he did very well, thank God, and getting very angry and saying, no, don't thank God, thank him. He was the one who did it, uh, the, the person, I. Um, so I completely rejected everything. So what brought you back? Well, I don't really know, actually. I just started to, to read the odd thing. And the, I suppose I, unconsciously, I felt there was some sort of gap in my life. But I wouldn't have been able to put, a, you know, words to it. And I started just out of pure interest, reading the odd book about, uh, you know, various belief systems. Um, and that's really what started the journey back, I suppose. What sort of belief systems did you read about? I mean, did you try well, other faith? Yes, I mean, I was, I, it, it sounds so trite, doesn't it, to say something like, I was a Buddhist for three years, but, but I, that was what I sort of went into, and, and, and Hinduism, and, uh, uh, and I read the Quran, and I, I tried and looked at everything, trying to find things that called to me, um, but nothing, as it were, fitted. Do you know what I mean? Little bits meant things, but nothing actually fitted. And then I was reading uh, Jung, and uh, one of his things was when, when a, a patient or an, an Alessand went to him, one of the first things he would always say was, go back and search and look at the faith you were brought up in, because that will obviously have echoes in your, in your unconscious. And uh, it was through that, actually, that I rediscovered uh, that part of me, that the very spiritual part of me, that actually was not being fed in any way, shape, or form, and it had been ignored actually for years. And and there was a, it was to do with you know that thing I, I talked about about the going feeling of going home, um, an extraordinary kind of homesickness um, would would well up in me for something that I didn't know. You know how can you feel homesickness when when you don't know what you're being homesick? But I did, and I think it was that feeling. Uh, so it was a very gradual process. It, there was no blinding light or anything like that. I mean, I suppose there was one moment, actually, that I remember, which, which meant a great, great deal to me. It was when I was, when I'd started to sort of search again through Christianity and through Christ's teachings and so on and so forth. And I was watching, they re-ran the interview, um, the, the John Freeman interview with, with Carl Jung. And he was talking this extraordinary man, and uh, and then Freeman said, "Now you were you were brought up, you know, very strict faith, and so on and so forth. Now, and he was now in his eighties, young, um, you know, through everything that you've been through, do you do you believe in God?" And there was this wonderful moment, and he said, "No, no, I don't believe in God." And he said, "I know." And it was like. Ah, oh, I mean, I literally leapt off the sofa and I was on my own and shouted. And it was like, that's it. That's, that's, that's what I want. That's what I want to go towards. You know, where I can really, honestly, the whole of my body, mind, soul, everything can say, I know.
the last line there, and, and at my departing, you're frightened of death. I'm frightened of dying. I'm frightened of, I mean, I think one would be a fool not to be afraid of possible pain and so on and so forth. But death, no, not at all. In the last sort of two or three years, I've, I've thought about death, I guess every day, actually. It seems very important that it should be part of life because it seems to me to be not the opposite of life, but the opposite of birth. So it's another transition that we go through. I mean, I, I actually have a great belief in original blessing. There is, in fact, a, a, a tremendous movement in, in, in the church now, in, in Christianity, both the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, I, I believe, um, which is called, I think it's called creation spirituality. But it, it is actually to do with this idea of original blessing, that we, we come, um, I tell you, there's, there's a wonderful Wordsworth poem which seems to encompass the idea of the fact that we come with original blessing rather than original sin. Um, and it goes, our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life's star, hath had elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar, not in entire forgetfulness, nor yet in utter wakefulness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God, who is our home. And I just, that's what it seems to be about, that we come from this amazing source of light and energy. And we come, we are part of that. We are, I mean, I think that's why some people say, you know, um, you know I am God. And, and people say, uh, uh, uh. We, we are all part of God. We're all this little bit of this amazing thing. And um, it seems to me that it's all to do with love. It's all to do with unconditional love. And um, I think it's one of the hardest things to learn. And I can't even begin to say that I've, I mean, maybe I've touched it every now and again. But that seems to me to be what it's all about, is learning unconditional. And that, of course, that encompasses the whole, I mean, that encompasses everything in everybody. Every sort of living thing is, is, is knowing how to, not in any pie way or any sort of sweetness and light way. That's really yucky, because that's actually ignoring the fact that everything and everybody has their dark side as well. We can't exist, can we, without that? I can't exist on my own. What, what would I be without other people and other things? I mean, I would be, would this be no point?
If you had to encapsulate it in a nutshell, how would you say that your beliefs have changed over the years? How do they differ now from what they were originally? Well, I tell you, actually, there's, uh, the analogy is with rehearsing a play, I have to say. Because you come to the first read-through, and you will read it, and you'll actually be, your instinct will be spot on. And you then go through that painful, painful period in rehearsal where you're finding out why you were right. So from ignorance through knowledge back to an, a, a, an innocence. And that's what, the, for me, the journey has been about. It was as if, uh, you know, like the Wordsworth poem, I was born with, with, with all that. And then I went through the, the, the dark, as it were, and tried to find out the whys and the wherefores and tried to do all the head stuff. Um, and that what, what's happening is that I'm coming back to what I came into the world with. Sounds very instinctive then, really. It's deeply instinctive, yes. I'm, I'm not very good. I mean, I do try and, and, uh, and do all the analysis, you know, with the head and the work out the whys and the wherefores. But actually, finally, when I come down to it, I'm actually much better if I just go with the instinct and the heart, actually. I, I often think that um, my my life has been, imagine um, being born uh, and there you are, this, this hose pipe straight from, straight from God, right, to, to there. But that hose pipe during the course of your life, it's all tangled up and knotted and, and the water won't flow through, the energy, God, the, the God will not flow through. And, and so you spend your life, I've spent my life trying to untangle the hose, right, so that what happens then is that as it gets more and more untangled, so it's easier for, for that to flow through and you become, well, I suppose you become a, a, a channel, really, hopefully. Let me bring your love Where there is injury Your pardon, Lord And where there's doubt True faith in you Oh, Master, grant that I may never see so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me the channel of your There's despair in life, let me bring hope Where there is darkness, only light And where there's sadness, ever joy Oh, Master Grant, that I may to be consoled
I'll be surprised that Stephanie Kerr is actually much younger. She always seems to be playing these parts of decrepit old ladies, <laughs> Allah waiting for God. Because people are young? actually, yes, it's very nice, it's very cheering, because people, people say, oh, you're much younger, Arthur. <laughs> you don't like to say, well, it's just because I haven't got the grey wig on and I've, I haven't got the makeup on, you know what I mean? But I have to, it was, it was very funny. I'll tell you a story about it, what happened not very long ago. Uh, we were filming in Brighton, right, for Waiting for God, and I was in the full costume and makeup, right? And this woman came up and she said, uh, she said, what are you doing here? I said, we're filming a series called Waiting for God for the BBC. Oh, yeah, she said, Waiting for God. She said, who's in that then? So I said, well, um, Graham Crowden and Stephanie Cole. Oh, yeah. I know Stephanie Cole. She's George Cole's mother. <laughs> I, th I, d I took that to heart. That was upsetting. <laughs> that was upsetting. I'm a great admirer of George Cole, but I am not his mother, nor am I old enough to be his mother. You played an Alan Bennett character in, in, in one of his, his talking heads, mm -hmm. an army widow. It was called Soldiering On. You've chosen who would true valour see. I mean, what do you regard nowadays? I was thinking of that, that old widow, mm. soldiering on. I mean, what do you regard as valour today? Well, I mean, w when you think of valour, people automatically think of people doing amazingly brave deeds and so on and so forth. I think of valour today as actually just putting one foot in front of another. I think of this is a very, the, there's something very personal here. I have a brother who's schizophrenic. And that for me, anybody, for example, who has to live every day with an illness like that, putting one foot in front of another, staying alive, is incredibly brave, incredibly courageous. Um, I think it's keeping on, keeping on, really, it seems to me, particularly in the world in which we live. It can be very hard, you know, with the recession and, and so on and so forth. So that seems to me to be valour. Me to have quite a bit of serenity about you, a bit of a bit of inner peace. I'd tell well, that to my <laughs> daughter. <laughs> no, no. But what's the difference between serenity and smugness when it comes to belief? I don't know what the difference is, but it's a huge difference, isn't it? I mean, smugness is, well, I've got it right. I don't know about you, but I've got it right and I'm all right. Uh, whereas serenity is, 
listen, I don't know whether I've got it right, but it's like, it's also, serenity seems to me also to be, for me anyway, it is to be willing to encompass change or, you know, to be flexible. It's not to be sm stuck. Smugness always seems to be frightfully stuck. You know, you're smug, sitting with your fat bottom in a rather, you know, rather comfortable armchair. Where there's serenity, it's like floating, changing, moving, amoeba-like. About the swan with the, duck, with the feet paddling madly underneath. Yes, yes. We've heard lots of music. I mean, is, is singing, is the physicality of actually singing music important? Oh, I and love inspiring? it. I love it, yes. I mean, physiologically what it does for you is terrific. But also that, um, yes, and, and particularly when you join with lots of other people uh, and, you know, and you all sing together. It's a wonderful feeling, isn't it? Whether you're doing it in a musical in the West End or, uh, you know, or in a church or it doesn't matter where you are. What sort of music's best for that then? all sorts of things, but I, I have a favourite one, which is almost a chant, which is Adoramus Te Domine, which means, we adore thee, Lord. I think you can transcend with a chant. It takes you out of yourself and into, so that you can experience um, that sort of great white bubble where your mind ceases to be that busy little ant that of running from thing to thing and thought to thought and just actually is at peace. A lot of people spend much time looking back on what were often called the golden years or looking forward to, to it'll be better. You seem to be very much a now person. This is it. This is for real. This is life. Let's get on with it. And celebratory. Is that fair? 
Yes, I think it is actually. I mean, when I when I was a when I was a, a young student, a, a, an aspiring actor, um, the, the great sort of catchphrase I was at the Vic School was "Play the now." Uh, when you're acting, play the now. And it seems to me to be equally valid for life, play the now. I mean, obviously the past informs the now, and what you do in the now informs the future, but it seems to me to be very important to actually be in the moment. And I know that now is a, is a chaotic time in the world, deeply chaotic and deeply frightening. I mean, I think it's terrifying for everybody. Uh, and I think that's why, you know, people go to such extremes, extremes of violence, extremes of religious belief, etc., 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 because everybody is frightened. But I think that, it, that, that this time can also be um, a, a time of, of tremendous excitement and challenge. Um, there's a wonderful, wonderful bit of uh, Christopher Fry from a play of his called Sleep of Prisoners, which seems, for me anyway, to in, encapsulate this and, and, and seems to be for me to be a clarion call uh, to, to all of us living now and it, um, uh, it goes like this the human heart can go the lengths of God dark and cold we may be but this is no winter now the misery of centuries begins to crack break move the thunder is the thunder of the flows the thaw the flood the upstart spring Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us, till we take the longest stride of soul man ever took. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration into God. Where are you making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake. But will you wake for pity's sake? At the same time next Sunday here on BBC One, Sweet Inspiration with the MP and musician Emma Nicholson. BBC Two shortly, the Money Programme features a report on the Financial Services Act. Next on 999, trapped on a sinking ship, could the rescuers save themselves? The massive explosion that left a woman buried under tons of rubble. A wasp sting that might have meant certain death. And even in peaceful Devon, Accidents can happen. Heroism and bravery. 999. Tuesday at 9.30 on BBC One.